This last Sunday of 2015, I'd like to talk to the subject of <coughs> becoming believable belie believers. Believable believers. I uh, was approached a few months ago when I preached a sermon talking about good Christians and uh, how good Christians sometimes are not so good. Now, after the sermon, someone <laughs> who was actually paying attention to me asked me what makes a good Christian good. It's a good question, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, quite often we we get caught up in the bad behaviors and not so holy actions of folks and then miss what may be causing these behaviors, these attitudes. Sometimes we're so wrapped up in what a person says or or does that we will overlook the motivation behind the saying and the do. Here's a news flash. No one, not even the pastor, knows every means by which a person can be considered good. All right. All right. If they tell you that, they're lying. All right. All right. I mean, we can we can look at, at what Jesus taught and where where Jesus taught. We we can look at what Jesus did and where Jesus did it, and that's a pretty good start. We can look and heed the great commission of Matthew 28. That's a pretty good start. We can look at the great commandment and what's been called the great compassion of Luke 10 and 27. If we want to stay and not stray. And I believe that the litmus test of Matthew 25, 31 through 46 offers clear examples of what it means to be a sheep and not a goat. I mean, we got some ideas about what good is. We're supposed to feed the hungry, care for widows and orphans, right? Clothe the naked, visit those who are in prison. Y'all know that. However, the reality is we are living in a world of competing values and mores where more and more people are seeking relevancy or purpose and the church is not offering the answer. I said the church is not offering answers not because the story of Jesus has changed but rather because the messengers have become unbelievable. If that went by somebody allow me to make it a little plainer. The messengers have become unbelievable, not the message. Hmm. Sometimes we talk out the side of our neck so much folks can't tell when we tell the truth. I didn't look at anybody in the face when I said that. With, with that being said, I believe that one area of discipleship that is often taken for granted but is vitally important is growth. Growth, physical growth, emotional growth, and spiritual growth. Growth, that progressive development or evolution outside and inside a person that makes the casual observer take notice. Growth. And while many of us recognize the physical growth in others and in ourselves, it's the emotional and spiritual growth that is often neglected and thus becomes stunted. Stunted. Allow me to offer a personal example of the necessity for growth. From the age of 50 until my father died, he suffered at least 12 heart attacks. After his second heart attack, my father and his doctors decided that he needed to have a bypass. He went in for a triple and came out with a quadruple. In my entire life, up to that point, I had never seen my father in a hospital. 
unless he was visiting someone else. My father was the strongest person that I knew. I said he was the strongest person that I knew. And until he found Jesus, I thought he was the craziest. <laughs> he was the strongest person that I knew. And I always assumed that he had his red cape and blue tights with the S on the chest hidden away in his closet. Uh -huh. That is, until I, I saw him lying on that, that hospital bed after his surgery, he was frail and pale with all of these tubes coming out of and, and entering his body. I, I was in the Navy back then and had been in one armed conflict already, had been around the world one time already, and I thought I was bad all right. until I saw my dad laying on that bed in ICU. I started crying ugly. Y'all know what ugly means. Y'all, I mean, it, it wasn't nothing pretty about this crying. It wasn't, you know, like you could go ahead and do a close-up and all you see are tears fall. It was tears and everything else coming out. Yeah, I got loud. Got loud. And, 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 and I got so bad in my ugly crying that, that my daddy looked up looked at me with loving eyes and then told my baby brother get him out of here <laughs> fast forward to 2001 when my my father my, my hero suffered six heart attacks in that one year and I was there for every single one of them I didn't realize, I didn't realize how much I had changed or grown emotionally and, and spiritually until my father told me, you know, I, I've always been proud of you uh, and, and, and all that you've accomplished, but, but I'm even more proud of the man of God you're becoming. You see, what had happened, I didn't realize it was, after as, as every heart attack was coming, my faith increased. My, my, my faith increased to the point where I wasn't crying anymore. What I was doing was just reaching out and praying for my father. You know, I wasn't worried so much about me. I was worried about my, my, my dad. You see, I had been through the storms of watching my loved ones suffer. I had been through the storms of watching my Superman become mortal. I had grown without me even recognizing it. Yeah. 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 So in December of 2001, when my father suffered his last heart attack in the pulpit of the church where he was serving, I still preached a sermon in the church where I was serving. All right. All right. Yeah, there was some mad folk in me. Well. How can you get up and preach when your daddy's in the hospital now, what? having had a heart attack? I had to explain to him that my daddy, if I went in to see him and, and he asked, because the first question he asked me when I went to see him was, did you preach? Uh -huh. And I said, yes, dad, I did. He said, good, because you probably would have got cussed out if you had. I'm just being honest with you. Yeah, all right. When my dad died on the table, the following Monday, I was able to lean on the promises of the Lord, believing in the promise that I would not be fatherless. And when we, we celebrated his home going, I was able to be uh, to console others, not because I was the next superhero, but rather because I had grown or progressively developed or evolved to a point where I knew what many saw as an end was in fact just a new beginning. In other words, I, I, I believe. And hopefully, in the process, became believable. Uh -huh. I promise I'll come back to my story in a minute. I'll, I'll get back to my testimony. However, as we delve into today's gospel lesson, we encounter the only recorded event in the life of Jesus when he was a boy. Now, in the Jewish custom, Jesus is one year away from be being considered a man. 
Jesus is in that transitory phase who, where he's too old to be a child, yet too young to be considered an adult. I mean, right. he's grown, but he's not really grown yet. All right. All right. Most of us can relate to this phase of life. You know, we can remember the physical, emotional, and hormonal struggles that we felt during this time. This is a, a time when we do things uh, and say things and think things that sometimes don't make any sense to anyone else, including ourselves. Yeah. And eventually, most of us will grow out of this phase. I said most of us. Yeah. <laughs> However, some of us remain stuck in this place for a long, long, long time. Amen. Yeah, we all know somebody that's still in that phase now. We stay in what I've heard referred to as that, that Peter Pan mentality and never wanting to grow up. We find it difficult or simply refuse to, to stop acting in a childish manner. You know, for some of us, this might mean refusing to share what we have with anyone else. It might mean speaking or acting in a cruel way towards somebody else because they're not like us. This might mean never remaining satisfied with what we have and always looking, always planning, always plotting, always scheming to try to take what we don't have from somebody else that does have it. All right. If we Christians self-identified as a believer, we might be seen by others as unbelievable. Mm -hmm. All right now. Jesus' family, Mary, Joseph, and all his kinfolk have gone to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. The, the, the Passover is this huge event in the Christian or the Jewish year, and it was a requirement that all Jewish males make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem at least one time in their life. Some theologians have estimated that the population of Jerusalem during Passover would double or even triple from what was originally there. Yeah. You know, they were doing Mardi Gras before Mardi Gras was Mardi Gras. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Amen, somebody who's been in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Uh -huh. I imagine that Jesus' parents were not that much different from our parents or from us for that matter. You, you know, some do's and don'ts have been laid down before they ever got to Jerusalem. I can hear Mary and Joseph now. Boy, there's going to be a whole lot of people around. And, and, and don't let yourself get out of my eyesight. Am I the only one that's ever heard that? We get ready to go out in public. Don't show out. Huh? They didn't have time out when I was a child. Sometimes we think good is 
what we think good is. And quite often what we think good is ain't good. Yeah, maybe, just maybe, we are encountering so much not so good because we are not introducing over and over again the divine presence that, that grows in us as we grow in grace. Maybe, just maybe, our not so grown children are seeking because us grown believers have forgotten All right now. that the church is a place where children are supposed to be offered to the Lord right. and then incorporated into the life of the community. Yeah. The church is a place where old men and old women gather to remember the past and then long for a hope-filled future. The church is a place where offerings are brought. The church is a place where people submit to God. The church is a place where prayers are prayed and souls are sown. The church is a, a place where we can praise God who brought us through a week and praise God for the next week to come. Maybe, just maybe, some of us have forgotten that the church is not a place, but rather a space where the Spirit of God the church is not a building, <laughs> but rather a group of believers who are being equipped to do every good work according to the Lord. And maybe, just maybe, if we believers went back to church, I said went back to church, then we might become a believable church. Let me get back to the lesson. I don't want anybody throwing umbrellas at me yet. Jesus is in the temple or in the church house and he's listening, asking, and answering questions. And the scriptures tell us that everyone, everyone, not some, but everyone who heard this 12-year-old boy were amazed at his level of understanding. In our text, Mary and Joseph are astonished. That's what my scripture said. <laughs> astonished. And I would imagine more than just a little angry. When, when Mary confronts Jesus, it's not that difficult to see the potentially sticky situation. Here we've got the Son of God doing God's work in God's house. And his mama confronts him for not being where he's supposed to be. Who is the grown one here, I, I wonder. When we think of the hard choices that we have to make in life, there's no problem, believe it or not, quite often recognizing good and evil. We, we make the wrong decision not because we don't know any better, but because we choose not to do better. Somebody talk to me. It's relatively easy knowing which way to choose when we're faced with drugs or murder or but what about those times in our life when we've got to choose between good and good? Good and good. What about those times when we've got to choose between that job that's going to set our family's financial stability for life and that calling that truly makes our heart sick? What about those times when we've got to choose between spending quality time with or taking time to visit somebody who's sick in the hospital. Who's the grown one here, I wonder? And just so nobody thinks that these types of tough choices are limited to our personal lives, what about those times when the church has to choose between good and good? Those times that the church can either support the community by providing necessary space for a program or support the community by providing meals to the need. All right, all right. And no matter what we choose, somebody's going to be mad. And because we good people want to do a good thing, we will dig in our proverbial heels refusing to budge, refusing to compromise, refusing to try to work it out, determined to get our way, and showing the seekers who are around us that we are no different inside the faith community than they are outside the faith community. How, how do we reveal the growth of the Holy Spirit in our life? Many times, folks around us can't tell that we've got the Holy Spirit in our life. They know we got some kind of spirit, but it's not holy. 
and obey our God, then we will grow in grace and grow in holiness. Uh, I'm talking about wanting to feed 10 families. And God blesses us when we can feed 40 instead. I'm talking about reaching out to the community and the community ends up reaching out to us. I'm talking about wanting to act like the church. And then something strange happens and we're transformed into a church that actually acts like the body of Christ. There's no tough choice when we listen to and obey our God. The world may not understand why we do what we do, but as long as we are focused on being about our Father's business, then God will be pleased. On this last Sunday of 2015, I'm not going to shout yet, but on this last Sunday of 2015, if we want to become believable in 2016, I'm going to offer some words of growth. We must be about our Father's business. Unafraid of what the world may think. Unafraid of what the world may do. We must be about our Father's business. Feeding the hungry. Clothing the naked. Visiting the sick. And the dying. Visiting those who are imprisoned. Caring for widows and orphans. Regardless of how they look or how much they make or what their last name may want to become believable, here's a word of resolution for you. We must be about our Father's business, providing hope for the hopeless, giving joy to the joyless, showing love to the loveless, regardless of how we were raised or what we were used to or what we used to be. We must be about our Father's business. We've got the opportunity to be a beacon of light in the community. We've got an opportunity to transform neighborhoods and lives in the neighborhoods. We must be about our Father's business. We must be a community church who's out in the community. We must be about our Father's business. We must go into this new year boldly proclaiming our love for all of God's children. We must go into this new year boldly proclaiming our love for all those folks who are not like us. Thank God they're not like us. We must go into 2016 boldly stepping out, believing that if we go turn to please the Lord, that God will be pleased and bless the fruits of our labor. We must be about our Father's business. I'm almost done. But before I sit down, I have to say this last piece. Uh, the last verse says that uh, that Jesus grew. All right. I said he grew. Yeah. They say he grew in right, he say he grew in grace and, and grew in stature. Yeah. See, yeah. the thing is, when you are about your father's business, yeah. then you can't be the same way yeah. today yeah. that you were yesterday. Yeah. When you are about your father's business, huh, you can't act the same way today yeah. that you did yesterday. Yeah. When you are about your father's business, yeah. huh, then you won't talk the same way today uh, that you did yesterday. Uh, you see, there's something about an encounter with the living God uh, that changes us uh, into new creatures. There's something about an encounter with the risen Christ uh, that makes us new creatures uh, who won't walk like we used to uh, or talk like we used to. There's something about an encounter that makes us different uh, and when we were yesterday, so I don't know about you, but I'm glad. I said I'm glad. I'm glad that I'm changed. I'm glad that I'm changed. I'm glad that I'm grown. I'm glad that Jesus is alive in me and the same God. That bless me. The same God looked down and saw me when I was out there wilding out. The same God who covered me when I was turning corners. The same God who comforted me in my misery. The same God 